<laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this open forum. Uh, as I can see from the pack room, this is probably the most uh, eagerly awaited uh, discussion. Uh, my name is Shoab Kagda. I'm the editor-in-chief of uh, the Jakarta Globe, which is an English-language newspaper in Indonesia. Uh, as most of you may know or may not know, Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation on earth. It has 240 million people, 90% of whom are Muslims. But constitutionally, it is a multi-faith society. Uh, the constitution protects the rights of all minorities. But as in a democracy, there are many uh, factors uh, at play. And I think if you've been following the news recently, there have been um, the rise of what I would call the uh, radical right Muslim faction within society. They have a space, they are, they are able to voice uh, their beliefs and their, their feelings. But the majority of Indonesians, I would say, are mostly tolerant Muslims. And I think that leads into today's discussion. Uh, uh, as a, The topic is, is religion outdated in the 21st century? And maybe I can start by um, relating a story that was told to me over dinner the other day uh, by a very noted author, Mr. Paolo Kulho. And the story goes like this. Since we were in Switzerland, I'll use the Swiss uh, background. There's a small village uh, in the heart of the country. And in this village, the population is divided 50-50. 50, 50. 50 believes in God, and 50 does not believe in God. And every day they are fighting. So one day the mayor says, okay, let's put this to rest. I'm going to invite the whole village on a Sunday to a discussion. And we'll discuss all day long if it takes to see whether... An... Welcome, welcome. We're just getting started. Uh, we'll discuss whether or not there's a God, and at the end of the day... After the discussion, we'll come to a, hopefully we'll come to a conclusion. So to, to help the discussion, the mayor invited uh, a very prominent uh, priest to, uh, to uh, debate on behalf of God, and he invited a scientist uh, to debate on behalf of the atheist. And so they debated all day. And to and fro, to and fro, at the end of the day, they still hadn't come to a conclusion. So the mayor says, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll all go home, we'll take a rest, and maybe we'll come back. So everybody went home. The father went home, and uh, I'm sorry, the atheist went home and decided to kneel and pray. And he says, I now believe there's a God, because nobody could convince me that there was no God. The father went home and decided to burn everything that was religious in his house because he says, I could, not, I could not convince the atheist to believe that there is a God. So on that note, let me uh, please introduce my very uh, distinguished panel. Uh, we have a panel which, has, which is, I think, uh, comes from very, very broad uh, backgrounds. And I think we'll, we'll have a very lively discussion because I think while everybody out there in the Congress is debating about you know, worldly affairs, I think the real issue it will be debated in this hall today as to whether or not religion still matters. So let me, uh, let me start with my left. Uh, to my uh, furthest left is uh, Father Christopher Jamieson. He's the director of National Office of the, uh, uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, Father Jamieson has been uh, a prolific author, I think, and uh, I think we'll, we'll wait to hear from him. Next to him is um, a scientist, uh, Dr. Lawrence Cross, who is a professor and director of the Origins Project from Arizona University. Um, as a scientist, of course, I'm sure he will give us the scientific view of religion and whether or not uh, there is a God. Um, on my uh, immediate left is uh, uh, a young entrepreneur, uh, Ms. Narkis Alon, who, who hails from Israel. She's co-founder of ZZ, um, and she's a global shaper at, at, uh, at the WEF. On my immediate uh, right is um, uh, Ms. Carol Kehan. She's president and chief executive officer of the Catholic Health Association in the USA. 
and she is very involved in healthcare, and I think she will bring in a perspective of how religion plays a role in uh, the healing process. On her right um, is uh, Rabbi Pinchas Goldsmith. I hope I got that right. Um, he is the chief rabbi and president uh, of the Conference of European Rabbis and the Russian Federation. Uh, and of course, from him, I would uh, hope to hear uh, a view on how religion plays a role in Israel today, uh, especially within the Middle East, uh, and maybe we can expand it to the broader Middle East. And on his right is, uh, uh, how do I address you? Uh, Mr. Sulak Siwar Kasa. Uh, <clears throat> he is the founder and director of the Satir Koses Nagapradipa Foundation in Thailand. Uh, he has been twice uh, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. He's a monk, he's an activist, and I've been just told uh, that he's also a very disruptive patriarch. <laughs> uh, so, the way we will conduct this is that I will give my uh, uh, panelists three minutes to state their case. And then we'll have a round of questions, three minutes each. Three minutes each to state their case, and then we'll have a round of questions. Uh, I will use my prerogative to ask the first question, and then I will open it to the floor, and uh, hopefully we will have a very interesting uh, discussion. So uh, maybe... Father Christopher, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I should also add, I'm a, I'm a Benedictine monk, but it's a bit chilly wearing a habit in the Alps. <laughs> so, is religion outdated in the 21st century? At one level, the question answers itself. There are four billion religious people in the world. So, at one level, of course, religion is not out of date because there are still so many religious active in the world. So, presumably, the question is asking, has the great developments in science and reason that came from the 18th century in Europe, has that European enlightenment developed in such a way that the beliefs of religion are now going to fade away and disappear? So what I'd like to simply offer you is a, 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 a mental picture that may help the whole discussion. Imagine a circle in which you write the word mystery, and around it are a series of arrows trying to penetrate the mystery. And one arrow will say physics, another will say biology, another will say psychology, and another will say theology. And that we are together trying to understand the mystery of life. Now this goes wrong when one person, as used to be the case historically, when one person puts their science, their ology in the middle. It used to be theology. But I would say the danger is that if we put another ology there, whether it's biology or physics or whatever at the middle, we will end up with a similar problem. And at the personal level, to conclude these, these opening comments, at the personal level, I think the biggest personal mystery that we all have is what kind of a person do I really want to be? We no longer inherit identities in the world. People are individuals much more now. And they have great demands in answering the question, what kind of a person do I really want to be? And I believe that alongside science and psychology, the great religious traditions of the world have a lot of wisdom to offer people as each of us seeks to answer the question, what kind of a person do I really want to be? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cross. Okay, well, um, of course religion is outdated in the 21st century. Um, most religious people to respond, it's, it's true that you may get many people saying they're religious, but none of them, in the first world at least, in the developed world, to first approximation, actually believe the doctrines of their faith. They like to be religious, they want to believe, to use something from the X-Files, they, they, they want to believe in believing. So that Catholics don't really believe that when, they, that when a priest holds a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ. No one really believes that nonsense. I have, in the last week, for, for spent more time talking to Jewish atheists than, than I can count. Most of the Jews I know are atheists, and they say it's perfectly reasonable to be Jewish atheists because there's other aspects of the Jewish religion they like. 
So the point is that the doctrines of religion w are outdated, and that's for good reason. They were created by Bronze Age or Iron Age peasants who didn't even know the Earth orbited the sun. So, those, so the wisdom in those books is not wisdom at all. And people take the wisdom. In fact, we've actually learned something over the last 20 centuries, and, and science has taught us how the world works. Now, for science, the interesting thing as a scientist is that uh, God is completely irrelevant to science. Sci most scientists don't spend enough time thinking about God to even know if they're atheists because they try and understand how the world works, and God never enters into it. It's, ju it's just completely irrelevant. And in fact, the more we've learned about the natural world, the more we've learned that you don't need any divine intervention to explain anything. As far as morality is concerned and the person you want to be, which is really what, what I think is the heart of what, what religion, when religion provides many things for people, and we can't deny that. The question is, how can we take the things that people need, community, uh, support, hope, and, and use the real world to build those quantities? Because religion, if you base your beliefs and your actions on myths that are incorrect, you're ine inevitably going to take irrational actions. And so what we want to do is, is, is what science does, which is force people's beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around, and not assume the answers to questions before we even ask them, and use the rational world to build a global society, not an exclusionary society, but a global world where people can live together based on the reality that we're all humans sharing this planet, and we need to work together to build a better place a morality based on rationality and not outmoded religious beliefs. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Narkis. Hi. Um, so first of all, I'm very excited to talk about religion, a very basic uh, theme in humanity, um, and especially that I come from Israel and I'm Jewish. And in Israel, uh, we are living in a multi-faith society. We have many religions, Jewish people, Muslims, Christians, Bedouins, Jews, more. So obviously that creates a lot of conflict, um, it's challenging, and we have some projects to uh, deal with this conflict, even uh, our president, Shimon Peres, is uh, creating gatherings between young people so they can understand each other. And, uh, but I guess many of you know about conflicts and stuff like that, so, and if someone wants, I can send him links afterwards. Um, but I want to present a different perspective. Uh, I want to present a perspective uh, that I experienced as a young person that grew up in Israel and traveled a lot in the world and met a lot of young people. So first of all, many of the young people I met, um, we feel that we have a lot in common, that something the internet provided us. We have some shared values and shared narrative. Young people from the Middle East, from all over the world, a lot of people, a lot of things also, I see it in the Global Shapers, but even when I'm just traveling, we see things the same, um, cross religions. But I can't say that means religion is outdated. Um, for me, religion is our connection to something higher. It's like the meaning of life. Um, what is this life? I don't know. <laughs> if someone in this audience knows, that's nice. Scientists something, sometimes they think they know. Um, that's nice. Um, for me, uh, of course, my father is a scientist. I have a lot of respect for science, but uh, for me, it's uh, just a very powerful religion. Um, it's another way to explain reality, but neither science or anything else can really give us the answers for our essence questions about this life. What are we doing here? What is this meaning? And I think, uh, as a young person, I'm still working with these questions, and I refer to religion many times because I found some answers there in these sources. So. I can use the Bible, but I'm sure in all the books we have the same values um, and quest like answers for these questions. And um, even now, when I'm uh, talking with people here in Davos, um, in a few conversations, for example, uh, yesterday I was sitting with a friend from uh, Argentina, and we were talking about entrepreneurship because we are both entrepreneurs. And then he said, yeah, so it's like in Genesis, it's a process of creation. And he started quoting uh, things from the Bible, and he obviously didn't grow up on the Bible. so. I think for young people um, that are non-religion, um, eh, officially, many of us uh, use these sources um, for our growth and for finding answers to the biggest questions we have uh, in this world. And so I think uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Carol. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Sister Carol Keehan. I'm a Catholic sister. 
I'm a member of, <clears throat> excuse me, the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul. Um, I am a Catholic who believes in the Eucharist um, <laughs> profoundly. Do I understand? No, but then again, I believe in a lot of things that I see in this world that I don't understand. If you ask me to explain the, the cosmos, you are, you're lost, but I do believe in the cosmos. So I, I do think that there are many people who believe profoundly. I have spent my entire life in healthcare. Um, the community that I belong to was founded in Paris in the 1600s and has to this day had as its focus a particular concern for the poor, whether they were the orphan or the uneducated and impoverished or those who um, need health care. Um, and so that's, that is my worldview. My worldview is the, um, the God that made me made each and every other person with the same dignity and the same rights, and that in any way that that dignity is not respected and, and supported, I need to, to do my best to step in and help that. And, and to do that because of my profound belief in, in the Gospels where Jesus Christ says, whatever you do to the least, and it's not just the poorest tiny baby. It's the irritating person. It's the person that overuses services. It's the ungrateful person. Whatever you do to the least, you do to me. When you believe that, it is compelling. If you don't believe it, you need to find another sort of life philosophy. I think there's a lot to be said about thinking about the kind of person that you want to be. But I also believe that there's a great deal of courage given and a, and a great deal of inspiration given when you believe that there is a person out there that you are called to be, that, that there is an almighty God that calls you to be something, someone, and it will be the very best you can be. Um, and that's, someone only does that when they love you. And it, pre it creates a profound sense of comfort. I realize that that can be ridiculed, just as my belief in the Eucharist can be, my belief in, in, in the Gospels. But it is, it is a profound conviction of mine, and I see what it means in the lives of young people, middle-aged people, and old people who look at others in that same view, look at others as people of equal dignity. It puts profound responsibilities on your behavior. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Rabbi, it's your turn. First of all, Grüezi uh, miteinander. This was hello in Swiss German. I am Swiss born and uh, have been in Russia for the last 25 years uh, as chief rabbi of Moscow and a year and a half ago was elected to become the president of the Conference of European Rabbis. Um, I understand I have only three minutes. Swiss make wonderful watches, but the Russians have time. <laughs> um, talking about uh, religion, organized religion, I always uh, remember when I invited a fellow believer, Jew, to come to a synagogue, he says, I'm against organized religion. So I told him, you know, you can come without any promise, but we are so disorganized. <laughs> um, I believe that religion is more relevant than ever. I think every time one of you enters an airport or wants to go into an airplane and has to take off his shoes, it reminds you that religion is relevant. And uh, I would also like to remind 
our atheists, brothers, that last century, the secular century, the 20th century, was the bloodiest century of all, with communism, with Stalinism, and Nazism, almost destroying the world. This century started on a religious note. Religion is becoming, again, very important. Europe, in the last few um, years, two or three years, has, in France, in Switzerland, Holland, Germany, attempts to accept laws, to pass laws against religion, against the minarets, against burqa, against circumcision, against kosher and halal meat. If religion would be unimportant, there would be no attempt to pass such laws. It is a clash between a postmodern Europe, a secular Europe, and a new wave of immigration who, is much, which, who are much more religious. Now, the famous historian, Neil Ferguson, uh, in his last book, Civilizations, discusses why are churches in Europe much emptier than in the United States. And uh, his theory, I don't know if he's right or not, maybe you can tell me, is that in the United States, you have a lot of competition. Here in Europe, in every country, almost, you have a state religion. And it is his uh, uh, theory that what made Europe great during the last 500 years was the civilization of competition. So I would like to close with, uh, you know, with another Jewish anecdote that once a rabbi appears in heaven after he dies and he's shown very small quarters in uh, Eden and a few minutes later a bus driver comes and he's given a great villa in the Garden of Eden. And the rabbi says, I was religious all my life. And God tells him, listen, when you were giving your sermon, everybody was sleeping. <laughs> when, when the bus driver was driving, everybody was praying. <laughs> so, uh, what <laughs> I would like to tell to my friend, uh, Lawrence the scientist, he can say whatever he wants, but he's the bus driver. And by him discovering the universe, he is going to bring people closer to God and closer to understanding God and his creation. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we definitely have the uh, makings of a great discussion. Uh, Father Sulak, your turn. <clears throat> I cannot speak generally for all religions, whether they are outdated in the 21st century. I could only mention Buddhism as I understand it. Indeed, my latest book entitled The Wisdom of Sustainability, Buddhist Economics for the 21st Century. I think the top economists here need to read this book because the, because the mainstream economics is going to the dog. You need to have something alternatively. Perhaps Buddhist economy may be a help. <laughs> Buddhism is more a set of tools for waking up to our original nature than it is a system of beliefs. For this reason, adherents to other religious traditions appreciate many of its tools. Our process of spiritual awakening becomes personal as we formulate our own process and practice within the Buddhist framework, or after translation into the language of other faith tradition. What follows is my own formulation of process and practices of mindfulness within my own Buddhist tradition. Buddhism offers useful resources for us to reinvent our thought processes and transform greed, hatred, and delusion into generosity, compassion, and wisdom, the root cause of evil. Buddhists would argue that greed, hatred, and delusion could be eradicated if we 
only educate ourselves properly in morality, mindfulness, and wisdom. Indeed, we need to reinterpret the fundamental teaching of the Buddha appropriate for the modern world too. We must practice outside meditation hall in places such as refugee camps or outside military bases or even in the shopping centers so that we can sow the seeds of peace and critical self-awareness cultivated within ourselves and engage with the world through nonviolent social action. However much we have achieved with more proper understanding of the world and ourselves, we should always take good care of our hearts in order to overcome greed, hate, and delusion in the wider society. I feel that Buddhist leaders in general, and indeed religious leaders in general, should raise their voices more often in speaking the truth to power, which is often corrupted, so that we could use our words of wisdom and compassion to transform society in meaningful ways. Speaking truth to power need not always be confrontational. We should also cultivate dialogue with the powers that be. I myself used to belong to the World Faith and Dialogue, which met regularly when the president of the World Bank at that time and other leading personality in mainstream economic development. Through dialogues, we have learned to respect one another and have tried to send form our views to be more holistic and really listen to voices of the poor. And lastly, if Buddhists want to be appropriate for the present and the future, they must understand structural violence because social structure indeed is full of violence, helping the rich and they're not happy either and oppress the poor and, and, and entirely destroy the environment. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, we will now uh, start a round of questions and I will ask a question of each of the panelists and then I will uh, throw open to the floor uh, to invite questions. Uh, maybe I will start with the Father Christopher. Um, you know, you've written a lot about happiness and you know, about how religion brings about happiness, I assume. Um, but what does it really mean? You know, um, does you know, a belief system drive your value system? Do you ask me what, what happiness means? Well, uh, what uh, happiness means, Because yes. everybody, everybody nowadays says, well, I just want everybody to be happy. You know, I, I used to be head teacher of a school, and the parents would all say, oh, Father, I just want my children to be happy. And actually, it's really, we need to ask, what do we mean by happy? Because it, it, ha happiness has a history. There is a history to the meaning of the word happiness. And what it's come to mean nowadays is feeling good. And uh, this means that the entire world is unhappy about 10 seconds after waking up, if you think about it, <laughs> especially if you're a teenager. And um, you know, by the way, why teenagers don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. It's because they, it took place in the early morning and they don't believe the early morning exists. <laughs> um, and the, 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 the happiness, I think, could mean, could mean uh, doing good and contemplating the good. I'd say those, those two things. To replace, rather than just the contemporary consumer feeling good, it's doing good and contemplating the good, which is where Christianity would strongly overlap with what Sulak just said about Buddhism. And what I would say is, though, that the difficulty is that the self-discipline required to contemplate the good and to do good is what our society finds very hard to acquire. And I think, at its best, religion provides us with the means of doing that. Thank you very much. Um, just building up on that, um, Narkis, you're the, you're the youngest on the panel, and I guess the closest to being about a teenager. Uh, so you might have an insight. <laughs> you might have an insight into this feeling happy. But you know, just taking up from that, you know, um, you're an entrepreneur. Uh, but you're also uh, obviously a very uh, a, a deep believer in religion. Uh, how do you match the two? Um, okay. So first of all, I really uh, agree with uh, what Christopher said about happiness and 
I just think that uh, the most important thing in our life is that we know to live them, the art of living. So um, this is, some people call it spirituality, but other people are intimidated when they hear spirituality because it sounds like new agey and stuff. Um, but I think all of us are connected to it. Um, I, I'm in social entrepreneurship now, and in social entrepreneurship, what you want to do, you look on uh, problems in society, and then you think about innovative ways to solve them, and um, usually you want to make it sustainable. And uh, actually, I think the biggest problem in society is that people don't like their life. And I feel that all of the things that we see in uh, society are symptoms of that. All the wars, all the arguments, all the things are just that. And if we notice on ourselves, like in days that we feel, feel good about ourselves, so we're just not, we're not having a fight. Um, we see it in our closest relationships and also in business. So um, a few days ago, I thought we should have spiritual entrepreneurship, like creating companies that create a spiritual value. And then I started testing it in Davos, and uh, some people asked me, because in Davos you're doing like, uh, you meet, I don't know, 100 people a day, and like, so what do you do, what do you do? So I started answering, I'm a spiritual entrepreneur. <laughs> so some people looked at me like, okay, why is she here and stuff? But actually, I really, uh, some am amazing things happened to me with a few very serious people, like yesterday I met a very successful, serious person, and he's like, I can't believe you're saying it, and then he took off a page from, uh, from his bag and he showed me that he drew a triangle of business entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, and spiritual entrepreneurship. And he's an achieved man in, uh, in this world, so it's really cool. And also, Christopher and I had a talk that he presented a project he wants to do, and he would say, okay, so what, how did you su would you suggest me to do it as an entrepreneur? So I immediately said, okay, you should, what's the business model, who are the partners and stuff? So I'm working with that, and uh, I would like to finish with a quote and uh, about what you said, because when you talked about feeling good, I thought about this quote, and I'm going to do it while I'm singing, because it's spiritual, so we are open-minded, okay? And so we remind them this song. It's a new life, it's a new day, it's a new dawn for me, and I'm feeling good. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I hope we're all feeling better this morning. Uh, having, <laughs> that, that's uh, the purpose. <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, keeping to, to this theme about feeling good, I'm going to move to Carol now. Um, I think probably you have one of the toughest jobs um, anyone can have is to heal people, uh, you, especially people who may be suffering, I think, uh, critical illnesses. Um, how important, in your experience, you know, um, how important do you think religion is to the healing process? I have a, I have a bias on that, naturally. Um, and so I would say to you that I think that it is, <clears throat> you don't have to be religious at all to be involved in the healing process. Um, and so I, I, I won't say that it is essential um, because you can give a vaccine without having any belief in God or any belief in a higher power or any thought of being religious. But I, I would say to you that the care of the sick, while many people will step back and say, oh, you know, I just couldn't do it, it's so hard, just as you just heard. For many, many people, it, it is the most fulfilling thing they could ever want to do and it is because of what they see. I can remember a nurse saying to me when I was running a hospital, I came to this hospital for the money. I have stayed at this hospital for the mission. And, and so it does make a difference. It makes a difference when you think, you, I just can't face another person with that serious an illness, or I can't I cannot be supportive again, or I, I am tired, I don't feel good today, but these patients need me, their families need me. I remember once when I was running a children's hospital, um, and my, the staff there did a magnificent job with children who were dying and with their parents. And this nurse came to me and she said, Sister, I care too much, I cannot take care of another dying child. And I said, Okay, Liz, I'll get somebody to take care of him that doesn't care at all. No, 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 <laughs> don't ever do that. And you know, it, and I said that is why you are so valuable to this child, and it and his parents, 
and, and you do pay a price, but in the end, it enlarges your heart even more. And so, quite, quite honestly, I think when you have a sense of the dignity and worth of each person and the importance of protecting that, you find, even in your toughest days, when you don't feel good, when you've had a fight at home, when you know your back is hurting and you're worried about your children and what they're doing in school, even in those days, when you have a view of the sick as people of great dignity and, and, and your role as someone who, who uh, has the great honor to be able to assist them, it makes all the difference in the world than if this is another drug addict or this is another, oh, another cancer or you know, same old, same old. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world. And so I would say uh, not only to what the patient receives from you, but what you receive from the patient. Uh, and, and so it's, it, it, is a, it is a great help uh, both to the, the caregiver and the, and, and the patient when there is a spirituality of healing involved. And we are at our most vulnerable when we're sick. So anything that helps is really important. Thank you. <clears throat> So it, it really flows two ways. Um, let me move on to the rabbi, you know. Um, and I'm going to address a question to you about um, the general conditions in Israel today. Uh, Israel is a multi-faith society, uh, but at the same time, it, it, try, it, it identifies itself as a Jewish nation. How does religion play uh, in the daily lives of Israelis? There is the famous uh, saying that you know, the, uh, two Jews uh, and three opinions and four parties. <laughs> uh, they say in the Jewish world, in the rabbinical world, that uh, wearing or not wearing uh, yarmulke in Israel or which color or which size is not a religious statement, it is a political statement, which was unfortunately true for many years. Um, looking back at the elections of a week ago, um, when of the 120 members of the parliament, of which I believe uh, 105 are of the Jewish faith, um, over 40 are today officially practicing religious Jews, meaning they're not going to answer a phone on Shabbat, they're never going to eat not kosher food, and they're never going to sit in a car, <laughs> on a train, on a plane, during the Jewish Sabbath or festivals. And what is most interesting about this thing is, let's go back 65 years, 1948, when the State of Israel is created by a socialist uh, left-wing coalition, David Ben-Gurion, in the new Israeli parliament in Tel Aviv, there's a discussion the Declaration of Independence, should we include the name of God? Or should we exclude the name of God? And two opinions, no consensus. So there was a Jewish compromise. We're going to write in the, in the Declaration of Independence, the rock of Israel. The atheists are going to explain this, that this is a piece of stone, important stone, and the religious people and the believing people are going to explain that this is God. My great uncle, one also Swiss-born, leaving Switzerland in 1933, fearful that Hitler is going to take German Switzerland as part of Greater Germany, and also one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence, was carrying the discussion. So, going 65 years later, what is very interesting is that it used to be that religion was politics and was totally politicized. There were the ultra-religious parties, the religious parties, the anti-clerical parties, and the socialist parties. What is happening today is that, uh, for example, the party which was the most successful one uh, during these last elections, Yeshatit, There Is a Future, which is f uh, started by a very famous journalist and mm -hmm. telepersonality, Yair Lapid, 
has with him his 19 uh, seats, he got in the Knesset three religious people. And uh, so has also the government, uh, Netanyahu's party, and even the left-wing party of Sipi Livni has also the, head, the previous head of uh, human resources of the Israeli Defense Force, who is also a religious person on her slot. So what is happening there is something very interesting, that religion is getting depoliticized. And, um, every, and uh, the secular becoming less secular, but which is something, something very interesting is happening now. You can think that the country is becoming more radical orthodox, but just the opposite is happening. Why? Because, for example, in four months from now, you're going to have the elections for the chief cabinet. Now, till now, there was um, um, the Israeli political uh, system was, okay, this does, it's not a question for the secular majority, that is a question for the religious minority. You decide among yourself who you want as a chief rabbi. So the general public was not interested in that question. Today, it's different. And the secular parties say, we are interested. It is important for us to know that the ne next Jewish pope, we have two of them, we have an Ashkenazi one and a Sephardi one, and should be a person who is liberal enough to speak to all of Israel and not only to the religious Orthodox minority. So becoming less secular, but also more tolerant. This is, I would say, this is the new Israel of 2013. I have to add, because I live in Israel all the time, you didn't. <laughs> um, no, I think we just... <laughs> I admit, okay. <laughs> no, no, um, you have a lot of important uh, points. I just want to add really quickly um, that, for example, you gave the, exa uh, the example of Yair Lapid. Most of Yair Lapid's campaign was, I'm going to make sure religious people is gonna, uh, are going to serve in the army. And so it's very complex. You have so many um, different opinions in Israel and uh, uh, many non-religious people. Um, you have, it's, it's, I, I wish what you say will be more true, you know, that we will be tolerant towards each other because I think this is the key, like uh, religious people and non-religious in Israel because we have the same cause, but we have, I, I feel just, it was, I felt that it's mandatory to represent this conflict of, um, that not uh, all the citizens in Israel serve the army. Um, not all uh, Jewish citizens, and I'm not saying how it's supposed to be, but like it's complex. That's all I'm saying. But I hope we'll, we'll go to a better place. As someone who doesn't live in Israel, I, I should say from looking right outside, it doesn't look like tolerance is a big part of the reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait, wait. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we, we we will have a discussion. I promise you, uh, Father Sula. Uh, you have you have. Um, experience uh, many tough times in your life. You've been exiled from your country, uh, but you've always found the strength to come back. And, uh, you know, as you said today, just now, you know, you, you've found the strength to, uh, to con contribute to society. What kept you going all those years when you were in exile? For me, an exile is very good for contemplation for reflections, and I can also see it's my privilege. People like myself at home, which was less privileged, were killed, were maimed. Indeed, the majority of the poor were destroyed. And people are not even aware of. That's why I don't use the word Thailand. Because the Thai are majority, and they're oppressing the minorities. In the South, we have the Muslim, Malay, they don't want to become Thai, and we should honor that. And my voice is speaking for truth, speaking for the minorities, speaking for what I regard as right, and I'm willing to learn from others. But the, peop the power that we oppress people. But looking back, I have been exiled for three or four times in my short life of 80 years old, but I think, on the whole, civic society in my country has become much stronger. The NGOs have become much stronger. And uh, my small contribution to them is that they, they need to be more spiritual. They don't have to be religious. That is, they should care more for others. 
particularly the less privileged one, and I see that it's moving, not only in my country, even Burma, the most oppressive regime, Burma is moving much more positively. Even China, biggest, most repressive civic society also moving, and they also become more and more spiritual. And I look forward very much positively for something positive from spiritual traditions for the future. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think that is one of the themes that we will try and touch on. You know, religion and, uh, and spirituality, are they one of the same or is there something different? But uh, I would now like to move to um, Dr. Cross. Um, as the only atheist amongst us, you, you, you've heard all the religion, uh, all the religious people uh, mm -hmm. make their point. My question to you is... So I should have five times as long as... <laughs> no, you have the same amount of time. Yeah, no, uh, sorry. My question to you is, does a true scientist have to be an atheist? Well, every, a, a famous biologist once said every scientist is an atheist when they go in the laboratory. They don't think anyone is twiddling the knobs they, and, and, and um, that they accept the fact that the evidence of the experiment will tell them what's going on. They don't think that someone's controlling it. So uh, I, I don't define myself as an atheist, I should first say that. I define myself as an anti-theist. Um, namely, I could, it would be presumptuous of me to say there's no purpose to the universe because I can't prove that. I can't prove there's no God. I can't say definitively there's no God. What I can say definitively, however, is that I wouldn't want to live in a universe with one. Okay? And, and the reason for that is that, that I find that this question of meaning is an interesting question. And if science tells us that there's no objective meaning to the universe, no purpose or meaning, does that make our lives purposeless and meaningless? Absolutely not, quite the contrary. It means the purpose and meaning in our lives is what we make. It makes what we do more important. It makes the compassion we show others more important. We're not being told what to do by some cosmic Saddam Hussein, who by the way in many religions doesn't just condemn you to torture for while you're alive, but for all eternity. You do it because we d derive meaning and, in fact, the recognition, not from religion that all humans have equal dignity, but from science, that we all have, we're all a common species. In fact, that there's nothing sacred, that we create compassion and action, and, in fact, that humans are no different than other animals in the sense of being evolved species. And we have to realize that we share the earth with them, and, in fact, those ideas allow us to address what are the real problems of the 21st century. And if we keep going back to this med medieval or earlier kind of myths, we won't address that. In fact, I, I sort of take umbrage at the at this sister's remarks because I don't think anything she said had anything to do with religion. She said understanding dignity, treating people with compassion, and then what people of religion do is they, they usurp that. They say, if you're not religious, you can't have any of that. But all of those ideas come from a rational view of who we are and how we should uh, relate to others. The best example of tolerance and across cultures that I can think of is nearby here in Geneva at the Large Hadron Collider. There is a machine that's built by people from a hundred different countries speaking a dozen different languages with many different religions and cultures, building these devices that have to work to a millionth of a meter. And it works because science brings people together. Science tells us that we, we, can, we are a common species and we can work together to make the world a better place. And I will close with a quote. You get, you, I won't sing it. You'll be pleased to know. Um, so I, from Jacob Bernowski, who said, you know, the world is permeated through and through by science. And you can't turn it into a game by, merely by picking sides. Like it or not, the world is governed by science. The physical world... And if we want to deal with our real problems, we have to accept what nature is telling us instead of imposing our beliefs on nature. Thank you. I am sure you know, uh, we have enough uh, topics and enough uh, uh, d discussion points to start uh, a very lively discussion. So now I will throw, uh, throw the questions to the floor if there are any questions. Uh, I will take, what I'll do is I'll take three questions uh, first and then we'll get them answered and then we'll move on uh, to the other questions. 
Now, please keep your questions brief and to the point, and also uh, who you are addressing the question to. Have a question mark at the end. And I have a question mark at the end. <laughs> yes, sir, in the front seat. Yeah. And then I'll come to you. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's coming. coming up. <clears throat> Hello, testing. Brilliant. Thank you, panel, for the lively discussion. I thought that was fantastic. Professor Krauss, big fan. <laughs> you know where my allegiance lies. Now, I would like to address to the religious side of the panel uh, two points. Much of the developed world is run secularly, and I mean constitution-wise. Yes, religion does play a role in the lives of people, I have no doubt, but why do we base our laws on secularity? That's my first question. Second question, when countries have been built on the basis purely of a religion, they've imploded. Pakistan and Afghanistan, and to an extent, I would argue, Israel. And lastly, just a quote, since that seems to be the trend. <laughs> the, the, Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama said, when science proves religion wrong, religion must evolve. Pun intended. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that, that question is an open question, I assume. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh. Ich habe die Frage, ob Sie nicht ähm, viel am Thema vorbeireden, der eigentlich in der, im Thema versteckt ist. Der Atheist sagt, ich möchte in dieser Welt nicht leben, wenn es einen Gott gibt. Ich glaube, das kommt der Sache am nächsten. Ist Religion noch zeitgemäß? Ja, ganz bestimmt. Viele wollen ja religiös sein oder sind religiös. Aber wollen sie hier diesen Gott haben, der sagt, ich bin die Wahrheit? Der sagt äh, zum Beispiel, Lüge bekommt eine Strafe von ewigem Feuer. Oder Homosexualität ist Sünde. Mann und Mann und Kind sind keine Familie. Wollen Sie so einen Gott oder wollen Sie den nicht eigentlich abschaffen? Das ist doch eigentlich die Frage. Ist das noch zeitgemäß? Und äh, ich glaube, das ist so. Sie wollen diesen heiligen Gott, der Maße an andere legt, abschaffen und äh, gerne eine Religion haben, die ihn ersetzt. Das wäre jetzt mal eine Frage an... Am liebsten würde ich, dass die, Frau, die Katholikin darauf antwortet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. One last, uh, one more question. Oh, this is at the back. Yes. Hallo. Ich bedanke mich für das Mikrofon. Ich möchte noch keine Frage stellen, aber ich habe eine Ergänzung, wenn es erlaubt ist. Wir haben über das CERN geredet hier in der Schweiz und ich möchte noch erwähnen, dass das kleinste Teilchen, das man sucht und noch die Wunder hat, dass man das unter anderem als Gottteilchen benennt. Das ist eigentlich nur der Beitrag für die Wissenschaft. Dann noch schnell etwas anderes. Ich war letztens in einem Managementkurs und man hat alles durchgecheckt, was man heute braucht in der Wissenschaft. Aber zum Schluss hat man gesagt, und jetzt erinnert euch, dass ihr auch noch eine geistige Fähigkeit habt. Mit eurem Geist könnt ihr noch etwas erreichen, das euch einen Vorsprung schafft vor der Konkurrenz. Und was heißt das? Der Geist, der Geist ist das Medium, das wir zum Allmächtigen haben. Es heißt schlicht und einfach, dass wir ins Gebet uns versetzen und für etwas bitten mit unserem Geist, das wir erwünschen. Und das ist eigentlich etwas, was uns im täglichen Leben auch sehr helfen kann. Und jetzt habe ich noch einen allgemeinen Wunsch. Das geht eigentlich an alle Menschen. Wenn wir uns bewusst sind, was wir in unserer Bibel lesen können als Christen, wenn wir nicht nur einfach glauben, dass der Sündenfall aus der Schlange und dem Apfel oder was eine Banane besteht, sondern dass wir wissen, dass es um den Baum des Lebens gegangen ist und den Baum der Erkenntnis, dann wissen wir auch, was wirklich in der Bibel steht. Und dann können wir uns auch eventuell ein bisschen verteidigen gegen außen. 
dann müssen wir keine Angst haben vor einem mit einem Kopftuch, sondern wir können ihm antworten in der Diskussion. Wir stehen für unseren Glauben ein. Danke sehr. Thank you. Uh, we'll take this question, these three questions first, and then we'll move on uh, to the next round of questions. So the first question um, points to the developed world and how countries are run on uh, secularism rather than on religion. Um, uh, maybe Father Christopher, you might want to take a jab at that. I think that um, it's a very short-term historical perspective to say that secular societies are wonderful and religious societies are dreadful. Um, I think that, that we're living through a great development in human history, which is the rise of secularity in, in culture. This is a new development, and it is highly successful. That cannot be denied. I think what's happening is that religion is finding a new place within secular society. And I would simply um, a quote from Pope Benedict, who addresses this question the whole time. It's one of his great themes is that faith and reason need to be in dialogue. And I think it's that dialogue which will produce a secular culture which has a, a public square in which all opinions can be expressed publicly, not just privately. And I think that, that, that for me is where it's going. And I think that where there is a fundamentalist religion still in control of the state, I agree with you. I think it's a very dangerous place. Can I, can I jump in and disagree? Sure. Yeah, um, a little bit. <laughs> I think, if, I think if you take the long term, you have a, a worse view of societies that have been run by religion in the long term of human history from the Crusades and back before that. I think that you found that human freedom eventually arose with the, with the enlightenment of, of, of knowledge and, in fact, open questioning, which is the hallmark of science. And, in fact, if you want to call it the dialogue of faith and reason, the hallmark of science is that nothing is above question, including God. And the minute we stop... We make certain things sacred and not subject to question. We, we demean ourselves and we stop thinking. I also think we're kind of, I have to say, I think we're missing, uh, we're, we're deviating from the point of this discussion. The question, we're, the question isn't, isn't re, is religion important? Because that's an obvious thing. Religion is obviously important. So are nuclear weapons. The, the, the question is, is religion outmoded and are nuclear weapons outmoded? And will the world be a better place without them? And the answer, both those, is yes. Uh, okay, religion is very important, nuclear weapons are very important, but neither of them in the modern world serve a productive purpose. And so I, I think that I, I, def I, I accept and don't need to debate the question of whether religion is an important part of, of the way the world is run. The question is, should it be, uh, should it continue to be, and is it decreasing? And in fact, what also hasn't been pointed out is that in m most places, in fact happily, monotonically in the, in the first world, um, the people identifying themselves as religious is decreasing year by year. The first year in England, by the way, as you know from a recent poll, more than, a, fit more than half the population finally acknowledged that they, they didn't have any religious affiliation. In the United States, even, it's been decreasing in spite of the efficiency of competition. So, in any case, I wanted to just throw those things in. Thank you. Uh, uh, one second. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity. Carol, oh, you want to... Subject. Okay, go ahead. I think we must not overstate the achievement of secular society. It gives you certain elements of equality, of freedom, but if you st stick to secularity, the spiritual element is missing. And particularly, religion at its worst or its base, also something you don't understand. And in the secular world now, you embrace a new demonic religion of consumerism, oh. promoting greed, promoting hatred, promoting delusion, even mainstream education, promoting ignorance, selfishness. I think. Those in the secular world need to learn to be more spiritual. One need not be religious, but if you take religions for the 21st century, you must reinterpret religion appropriately. 
I cannot speak for the Catholics, but from a Buddhist, you have to use two kinds of languages. One is the worldly language. God created the world in six days. It's worldly language. But spiritual language, the world was created mysteriously. And we should understand those people who believe in that tradition. Otherwise, you think that they are decadent, they are old-fashioned. I think every faith has its spiritual language. And if you respect those spiritual languages, you could have dialogue. And I think dialogue is also good for the scientists. If the scientists are so arrogant that they know all the answers, that will not be helpful for them. Okay, scientists is very helpful materially. But if scientists become more humble, they can use scientific approach to understand the mystery of life beyond materialism. Thank okay, you. I gotta come back. <laughs> um, I, 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 I find it remarkable. So the idea is that science doesn't have any spirituality, which of course is wrong. If you, wanna, if you wanna get awe and want, the reason I write books, the reason I talk about science, look at a Hubble Space Telescope picture of the 400 billion galaxies in our universe. Look out and see galaxies 10 billion light years away that may once have had civilizations around them that are living each of them as 100 billion stars. Look at what we learn about the universe. Look at how atoms work. Those things produce awe and wonder and mystery. The reason I'm a scientist is I love mysteries. And so to pretend that science is just dry and has no spirituality and therefore is some, somehow less significant than faith is just to misunderstand science and, and to demean it. And so the point, the, 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 the discussion we can have is how wonderful and amazing the universe is. And I think we would share in that discussion. But to condemn science as being... Um, Consumerism, look, I'm an educator. I want to educate people because I want to, them to learn about how to live a better life and how the world works and to be able to make their own decisions and to experience more joy because the more you understand yourselves and the more you understand nature, I think the more enriching life is. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> if I may just add, I think that both religion and science are basically two sides of the same coin, but maybe Carol, uh, would you like to jump in and talk about, you know, the goth of truth? I, I guess I get to um, to deal with the the Catholic. Um, you know, we probably do hold the record for making, being able to make the most mistakes. Uh, I, <laughs> um, so I, I, I but I, I think it is really important, and it is part of a mature faith to differentiate <laughs> your faith from your hierarchy, your rule makers. Um, you know, we've seen rule makers in science be wrong, and we've seen rule makers in religion be wrong, and we've seen people pervert science, and we've seen people pervert religion, and, and, and use it for their, own, uh, for their own good and self-aggrandizement. And, and we certainly, in this last century, have got way more um, than our share of examples of that. And although the other, the preceding century certainly do, I mean, often when I am in the Vatican at a conference and I come down the steps in the Vatican, um, inside the Vatican, there's this huge statue of St. Joan of Arc. And I always feel compelled to go up and pat her on the shoulder and say, Joni, I don't see any statues of those boys that burned you. Mm -hmm. It is important to remember that the mistakes in behavior, in rulemaking, by leadership, are not the faith. And if you don't do that, it, it, you don't grow to an adult faith. And it's part of understanding what your faith is about. You point out some really serious concerns. And it is so clear in the Gospels that, that God didn't ask us to judge others. There's a wonderful French play where at the end of the world, we're doing a lot of this end of the world stuff. At the end of the world, the, you know, they've got the ones on the right hand and the left hand side, God, and they're, you know, the right hand ones are ready to get into paradise and the, guy, the folks on the left hand are about to be marched down to, to hell. And they're, you know, the people on the right are really pretty 
uh, feeling pretty important about themselves. And suddenly, a rumor starts that God is welcoming everyone into paradise. And they start complaining and grumbling against God, and in that instant are damned. Because the essence of being like God is to be loving to everyone, loving to all creation. I would just say to my friend, Professor Krauss, he, I appreciate that he takes umbrage at my um, statements. He is not the first person to do so. If he would Google me, he would find himself in company with a number of bishops. And I'm sure it'll be the, probably the first and last time he's been in company with them. Thank you. Well, I was at, I was at the Vatican and I was in, and with a company of a lot of bishops. But, but let me, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna keep responding because I think I'm the only respondent to these <laughs> statements. That, um, I, I think that the, you hit a key point and I agree with you completely that you can't condemn uh, a whole population because of, of, of some individual, okay? Uh, but the difference is, and, and, is that there are no rule makers in science. There are no authorities. That's the hallmark of science. There's no such thing as a scientific authority. There are scientific experts. But the lowly student can, can in fact, disprove any... There's no chief scientist. There may be a chief rabbi. There may be a pope. But there's no chief scientist. We say, oh, what's, what's the answer? How should we behave? That's the key... That's the key facet of science that makes it so wonderful, is that there are no authorities. Now, of course, scientists, although many people wouldn't realize this, are actually people, and therefore um, they have met all the same foibles as anyone else, and they're scientists who, are, who abuse their science as, they, as well as every other aspect of their life. But the key aspect is there are no rule makers. Um, I want to add to the second question. So... I'm referring to what's written in the books. You spoke about us uh, religious leaders, but also in some of the books we can see um, some quotes that can be interpreted in violent ways. And I felt that the third question uh, answered the second questions, that uh, he gave the metaphor of the tree of knowledge. And uh, I really look on all of uh, the religious books, it's symbolism. And we as readers need to be intelligent and to interpret them in our ways, in our journey. Um, and. We can look at and we can see an example in Israel, which is a tolerant country, <laughs> as opposed to what uh, Professor Krauss said. So we have like some projects and examples of uh, people that are working together, although they are from uh, different religions, um, because they look on their books as symbolism and no, they don't really think that they're supposed not to talk to each other. It depends on the, peop on the person. And the last thing I want to say about science, in the university we studied, that there when was the scientific revolution, because um, once upon a time you could never say anything else that contradicts religion, and then there was uh, Copernicus, great guy, and he was uh, very brave. And then they had an agreement between the church and scientists, which they say that the scientists, um, what they can do is they can uh, describe phenomena that happen in the universe, but so they can explain how, but they, can ex they can't explain why. And the why is a mystery. That's not, not something that neither of us knows. And if someone in this room knows, like I said before, I would like to meet with him after. And I think it's like you said, two, two like, uh, sides in the same coin. And uh, let's be tolerant towards each other because- well, uh, yeah. uh, Hold on, I agree with the first, what, everything you said, but are you suggesting religion explains why? I think religion connects us to something higher, and then we can feel that the why is not something we can say with words. It is too big for this discussion well, I, and I for, um, for our finite minds. Well, I think science would, uh, would agree. Scientists would say that why is ultimately a stupid question. It doesn't, I mean, uh, <laughs> it, I think anyone here who's a parent knows that, you know, if you have a child, the ultimate answer to why, why, why is go to bed. <laughs> um, and I think that we, you know, we, when we, whenever we say, Whenever we say why, we really mean how. And so we can understand how the universe works, but we, why do we need to ask the question why? It may have no fundamental meaning. And so I don't think science presumes to answer that question. And if religion presumes to answer that question, I think inevitably it's proved itself uh, not being able to, 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 to do that. And in terms of the tree of knowledge and the, the speaker in, in the back who, who um, um, we, let's not talk about the God particle because it's, it's not, um, but, uh, why, and you said it yourself, why do we have to inter spend so much time interpreting the Bible? What is special about that book that no, is different than anything I, else? Special. I mean, that's the point. Uh, we okay. should not waste our time trying to interpret what people who didn't even know there were dinosaurs or the Earth orbited the sun or that evolution happened. Why should we try and interpret 
those ignorant beliefs in a modern world where we actually understand things. But okay, if science uh, is a fact, why do you advocate it? If you know it's true, why are you protecting it? I feel that you're, it's your religion. No, like you're you protecting your religion, very no, strong, you no, know? No, I know you said that before, but the big difference is, if you, the, the main thing is, in fact, what, I've always, what, what scientists hope for and what science does for us, and what I hope every student and every person experiences once in their life, is to have something they deeply believe in that's at the heart of their being, that without it they wouldn't feel they were human, proved to be wrong. It happens to me every day as a scientist, and that opens your mind. And so the point is that there no, I'm ready to change my views the minute nature tells me that. And if we, if we all were willing to change our minds when we were proved wrong, the world would be a better place. Thank you. I think we'll move on from there. <laughs> uh, one second, one second. Um, I saw a question from the lady previously, which I didn't get answered. Uh, yes, and then I'll come to the, person, uh, the gentleman in the middle, uh, and then I'll come to you, sir. So the last three, okay? The uh, mic there, please. Oh. Uh, I think it's wrong to hold the mic when I haven't actually indicated that you can ask the question. I have a little question for you, up on the stage, and the same question to the public. I have learned that you can ask questions here and the answers are immediately received. Who from you stamped from the Affen up? We don't understand the question. We don't understand the question. What was the question? What was the question? Who from you stamped from the Affen up? I didn't get... That is a very concrete question. Die mit der Religion zu tun hat. Stammen Sie vom Affen ab oder sind Sie aus Gott geboren? Can I give the, the Well, that's an can easy I give, answer. Can I give the answer to that? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll ask the prophet, uh, the father I, I, no, to answer I'm the give question. The answer to that. Yeah, yeah, give it. This question was first asked in Oxford, England, in the 19th century, by an Anglican bishop of Huxley. And Huxley quite rightly said, I would rather be descended from an ape than descended from someone who was afraid to ask that question. But there is a simpler answer, and the answer is we're descended from a common ancestor. We're not, we're not descended from modern apes. We, we, are, we have a common ancestor. And it's, an, it's not, a, as I said, it's like Brunelski's thing. It's not a question of choosing to believe. It's like choosing to believe if I walk out the 10th floor of a window that I can no, walk. No. The, the we are descended from a common ancestor. There's no doubt about it. The lady, the and lady. just stop. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll come to you, sir. I said you're the third person. Go ahead. Okay. I would like to ask a question to uh, Dr. Krauss. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that God creates human being? I think that's a basic question. And I will follow up with my next question after you answer, if you don't mind. Should I wait to answer, or do you want to? Um, it, well, does it depend on his answer, the question? Well, yeah, well the yeah, second yeah, question? His answer. Well, uh, I, I, you, uh, already, yeah. I mean, the point is that, that belief is, I don't believe in anything. Um, I, I, I asked the question, you know, how did, how did we arise here? And in fact, I, I, I've, what I've, what's remarkable is that I've discovered that uh, from studying science that in fact uh, uh, humans evolved from earlier species of animals and that life originated as chemistry turned into biology. And then in fact, a whole universe can arise from nothing. I just wrote a book about it without any divine intervention. So all I can say is I don't see any evidence of God. I don't see any evidence that there's a teapot orbiting Jupiter. I can't prove that there isn't. But I, since I don't see any evidence for God in any of my studies of science, the question is irrelevant. Okay, well, um, if you don't believe that God created a human being, then how do you explain what you believe is not a myth? Because that is I also can not test. scientifically... We are absolutely right. If yeah, tomorrow, as I've often said, I can't disprove that God. I would be presumptuous to me. You can't... Prove it in the negative. I can't disprove the existence of purpose in the universe. If tonight the stars realigned and said in Aramaic or Hebrew or you pick your language, I am here, you know what? I'd say, hey, there's something to that. 
Right. But in the absence of that, all I can say is my, I don't need that hypothesis in order to understand the universe. And so I'll just ignore it for the moment. That's all. I can't say if there's evidence for purpose, I would be the first person to be excited about it because what scientists want to do every day is not have a, have a, have a uni unified, you want to go into work every day and prove your colleagues wrong because that's how you become famous. But I think in purpose in life is not to become famous. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, that's <laughs> no, what I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm just saying each person should find his own evidence to the presence of God in something bigger. And when I hear a person says he doesn't find evidence, so it's pretty sad. And I think you should find evidence, not for science, but for your life, because it's happy. Yeah, I wouldn't say I didn't find evidence. I said science doesn't provide evidence. And okay. I think you will agree with that. Rabbi. Okay. In the method. Um, I've been listening very carefully. <laughs> um, uh, number one, I want to say that God does not need uh, my defense, our defense. He is strong enough without us. Um, and number two, um, I've been uh, fortunate enough during the last 25 years when I still came to the Soviet Union, an atheist state with an atheist state ideology. And I must tell you something. <laughs> I hardly found any atheists there. I hardly found any person. To find a person who says, I actually don't believe in God, I hardly found a person like that. There were a lot of people who uh, had questions how he looked like, how many, what's his name, how many are there. Yes, but a person who does not believe in a higher being I have hardly met a person like that. And uh, showing the renaissance of faith in the ex-communist um, bloc shows that the ingrained belief in the human, of the human being, that there is a higher being, and we are connected to him, is something which even 70 years of state atheism couldn't stop. That's a very good point, and I think that I think I'm sorry. I have to keep count because I'm the only voice. Yeah, I, 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 um, no, I, I, yeah. I, I, but no, no. I, but I think one second. I believe I, that you should speak because you are an endangered minority. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank you. I think not, but um, but but the key point is, I agree with you completely on the surface of what you said. Namely, I do think there's great evidence. Religion has pervaded all of human society throughout all of human history. There's clearly something ingrained, either in an evolutionary sense or a neuro neurophysiological sense, in the need to believe in something bigger than ourselves. And we have to, and to deny that is to deny the evidence of reality. That's absolutely true. But just because we all share that doesn't mean it's true. It just means that we have an ingrained need to believe that. We have an so so. I think the the. The, the recognition that religious belief is universal is really important to understand if you want to understand human beings and if you want to understand how to move to a world where we can address the problems that um, you know, xenophobia is, a, is in, in, ingrained in biological systems, that in and out systems, us versus you, all of these things have a sound evolutionary basis, but if we want to be a, a human society and work together, we have to understand that basis so we can move beyond it. And that's my feeling about religion. Thank you very much. I think we'll move on. Uh, there's a question from the middle, this gentleman, and he has the mic. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I have a question to all the panelists. First, I want to thank you, Mr. Krauss, because he seems to be one of the, well, I don't want to say the apostles of God, but he is slightly wrong in one little point. Devil's advocate, I prefer. He said, exactly. <laughs> okay. No, the real advocate, because he said there is no ruler in science, and I think he missed one word. There is no human ruler in science. So... Um, Klingon, maybe, but I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> My question is, where does knowledge, according to you, come from, and where does the advancement in knowledge come from? Thank you. Can I start? Sure. Uh, we'll take one more... We'll okay. take the two questions at the back, and then we'll continue. Uh, this gentleman first, the one who's... Uh, okay, that one, and then the one in uh, uh, the sweater. Yeah, hi. I'm struck by the fact that uh, all the defenders of religion on this panel defend it uh, largely because of the benefits that accrue, uh, if you believe, then X, Y, and Z, or the human need that is manifest, as Professor Krauss has said. And very seldom this afternoon, which has been very interesting, have I heard the word truth. 
Religion seeks to do two things as far as I've observed. One is to explain the universe, and the other is to bring all kinds of benefit. Um, so my question, I, I will have two questions, briefly. One is equally to both sides of this panel, including the endanger, endangered minority. <laughs> the do we believe in the convenient lie? If it were not true that there is a God, or similarly, if it could not be proven to be true that there is a God to anybody's reasonable satisfaction, including Rabbi Goldstein and everyone else, but you could show that there's benefit. You know, if people believe there's a God, they go around not killing each other, respecting their parents and this, that, and the other. Do we want to have it? And that question, I think I would pose equally to Professor Krauss. We can't prove there's a God, but that's why you're alive. Someone hasn't killed you because they don't want to be smitten by God. Do you accept that religion is good because it's brought about all this benefit? And the corollary question is, <laughs> is the benefit outmoded? Because I think that's the purpose of today's panel, to discuss about the outmoding of religion. So I posit to you, my own personal opinion, religion brought all kinds of bad stuff, the Crusades and everything, horrible. But it also gave us the Ten Commandments. And people obeyed those Ten Commandments because they feared a God that might well have not existed. And I also think that probably the few people believed in God. They suspected, they feared, they assessed. I don't even know what the word belief means. But that whole compendium helped them do good. Do we no longer need it? In other words, would we today respect the Ten Commandments or their equivalent, all these good things, without the need to believe that God will punish you because rationality is sufficiently ingrained? But I, I really do want an answer from the religious people on this panel to the former. Have you considered that your primary defense is one of utility and not of truth? Good point. <clears throat> okay. Good Only one sentence. And one question, and to make it sharp and sharp, uh, short, I speak in German. Ein Satz können Sie sich vielleicht ab heute daran erinnern. Wenn ich Gott kennen will, ist es besser, fünf Minuten zu gehorchen, als fünf Jahre zu studieren. Ich komme zu meiner Frage an das Panel. Da Sie so lange über Religion sprechen und nichts Konkretes über Gott sagten, meine Frage, an welchen Stellen sind Sie ungehorsam dem, was Sie wissen, was Gott von Ihnen will? Um. Okay, uh, we'll so take, since we have five minutes left, we we'll take one last question with, from the oh, gentleman, okay. uh, and then we'll answer the questions, yeah? Okay, sir. The Where's the mic? Uh, do we, we really we, think we have not going to work. We should fit, fit. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have time for another question if you actually Well, the last to... one, and then we'll round up. Okay. We don't have to answer each of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, actually, we are here. What we, what we actually wanted to discuss, what is written in the program, is what religion can do good for our society, also in economic terms. And in all monotheistic religions, actually, there is a pre we should not take any interest on money. And we are an economic forum which is written, committed to improving the state of the world. What is this economic forum, do forum doing? This is really my question. It's exploiting the world. They say we should have more growth. They say we should make money out of money and dis distribute. Uh, One billion people are, don't have enough to eat and so on. Actually, these are the most important questions. And I, I know that the religions, they have a big answer. They say what this lady, the, the nun said, we should share more, we should uh, stop exploitation, we should not steal, we should not lie and so on. So these commitments, I think it's so helpful but if I see how many weapons uh, got, uh, um, how you say, you know, giving, uh, how you say in English, uh, gesegnet, if you, if you see how many wars were supported by the religious organizations, I think the re the, then it's a big problem of ethics what we have on this planet. And I see a chance that the religious organizations can st stop the economic leaders to exploit this planet. Just go Sorry, on. We, what Just is the question? Because the, we the are running out of time. The question is if, for example, Mr. Goldsmith is able to stop the war in Israel and in other countries by saying, please don't produce weapons, stop to these productions, these 
these kind of things. Don't make money out of money. This is Goldsmiths uh, should be uh, knowing about this rule. Okay, thank you very much. I think what we'll do is, since there were so many questions and deep issues that were raised, each of the panels will be given one minute to sum up. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I would well, I, I'm going to drive it a little bit, since, since there was so much uh, interest raised. So maybe 30 seconds each. I okay, 30 seconds each to sum up. I'd like to answer the last question. I think if we are religious people committed to spiritual well-being, I think we should speak truth to power. Economic Forum here consists of full of top people in powers, and they are on the wrong path. They feel that the improvement of the world, in fact, is improvement among themselves. They strong the environment, oppressing the poor. I think we should be courageous enough to tell them and ask them to learn to be more humble. Even the scientists also need to be more humble, and they need perhaps to breathe more properly <laughs> and speak less and think less, and then perhaps we can make some contribution. Thank you. Rabbi. Um, very short. The Chinese Academy of Sciences a few years ago discussed why did Europe move forward in the last 500 years versus China, which was the most advanced, uh, most advanced society beforehand? And it, they said it was, uh, it was not science, it was not the armies, it was not the weapons, it was the religion. It was the European um, religions which created the support system, which created the successful Europe, of the last 500 years, which created science, emancipation, and uh, enlightenment. Number two, regarding Israel, um, in the secular century, the 20th century, a third of our people were killed in Europe, six million, and 40 to 50 million people were killed by atheists, by anti-religious systems and states much more than all the Crusades, religious wars put together. And uh, when our people created the state, three years after the end of the Holocaust, um, we brought in, unlike Switzerland, we brought in refugees from Sudan, from Somalia, and we are open to many other countries, and Israel is doing its maximum as a free society as the only democracy in the Middle East today. It's the only place where Christians, the Christian community has grown by 400%. In all the other Middle Eastern countries, the percentage, the numbers of Christians is going down from day to day. Let me try to speak quickly to your question about why we didn't speak more about God and the, the whole mystery of God and the transcendence of God and a, a personal view um, and perspective. And that was because of the title of the program. And so the program asked us to, to focus on the role of religion as opposed to a concept of God. And that's why you didn't hear more. At least that's, I think, why you didn't hear more from us. Um, I would certainly move then to your next um, thesis uh, about whether you know we don't need this concept of a transcendent God, and, and you your concept of this, this God that you know has the ability to punish, and that's why we do it. We're told that's not my concept, but but it is a concept that is very prevalent, and I'm, I I certainly am not going to argue that. And whether we would be, um, and we are not at a moment of great great enough maturity that we would follow the tenets of the Ten Commandments and have a safe world, even if we didn't have the Ten Commandments. And it sort of reminds me of um, somebody who was bragging to President Abraham Lincoln that he was a self-made man. And uh, Abraham Lincoln didn't think a lot of the, the product, and he said that was very nice of him to absolve God from the guilt. <laughs> so I honestly believe in my heart that if if you the, if the concept of God is having made the rule uh, made the world calls us to become much more 
than, than what we are now, made the cosmos. And I do think that uh, Professor Krauss is right. It, you can't, you know, you just cannot look at, at so much of science and not be in utter awe. I do believe that we need, whether it's in the form of the Ten Commandments or in our hearts, I do believe that we need something to help us not fall into the abusive behaviors we've seen across the centuries. I don't think we're much better than our predecessors. Thank you. We'll go uh, uh, from, the, from the out to the in. So, oh, wow. Father. Um, a quick parable. I think the people who raised the question about knowledge and truth are on to the point where I think there's a really, really important discussion. I give you a little parable, my picture of how it works. Um, I believe God gave all of us six boxes of knowledge, but he only ever gave five of us. He only gave us five keys and he gave our sixth key to another person. Well said. Well, uh, let's see. There were, there were a lot of questions, and they were good questions. I wish I had more time for it. Um, the, the, uh, actually, I agree with the rabbi that, in fact, religion, I do think, is responsible, for, at least in Europe, uh, for the rise of science. And there's nothing wrong about that. That's fine. And it's a rising enlightenment. And, it was, and the reason was it was the only game in town. It was the... It was the National Science Foundation of the of the 14th century, but so at least we agree on something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's right. And so, uh, but that's fine, and it led to something that's remarkable, and we should thank it and move on. Um, and but the question of, of of morality, which you really raise in some sense, or utility, is an interesting and a deep question, which really requires a lot more discussion. But I think I think the statement made that um, people don't kill me because they believe in God. I think. Few people in this room, although it's not so clear after this debate, but few people um, in this room would say they didn't, if they didn't believe in God, would they shoot me? I think almost most, most of the people in this room would say no. I've asked that to audiences only once or twice that people put up their hands and said yes. But uh, so I think there are other reasons that people have morality. And in fact, if we want to seek morality, I happen to personally think that the Bible, certainly the Old Testament, is the, where the Ten Commandments are written, is one of the worst places to look. There was no problem with slewing the firstborn child and of an entire civilization or giving your daughters out to be raped because you didn't want men to be raped. And so I don't think that's a really a morality. And the, but the final thing I think I'll say, and I think it's really important, this humility thing that you brought up, because, and, and I think it's an important part of the Buddhist tradition that I admire. But I think it's very, I think I, I should listen more, and I try as I get older. <laughs> but, but, but thinking less is something I, I never want to do. And I do think that ultimately science is the most humble activity. Assuming the universe is made for us is not humble. Assuming that we're an insignificant bit of our marvelous universe and we make the most of it as we can is humble. Thank you. Um, okay. So first of all, regarding um, the person that spoke about this gathering and the World Economic Forum, so we are gathering here multi-stakeholders and I actually think it's the best solution for the conflicts we have in the world because we meet people here as equals and I can see that so many people here are not so different than I am and I wish we had more gatherings uh, like that of uh, different organizations all over the world so we can feel that we are this global community that has this shared values. About um, the knowledge, where does knowledge come from? So I don't know. I don't know where knowledge comes from and I wish I knew and I don't know even What's going to be my next thought? Nobody knows what is it going to think in a minute. And I think um, that's the humbleness we're talking about, which is really important. And that's the places where we can really listen to God, like someone asked. Like, in these spaces which we really don't know what's left. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think uh, I would even try to attempt to summarize the discussion this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, it has been great. Uh, I think I would like to deeply and humbly thank my panelists for sharing uh, their thoughts and their feelings. Uh, I think they've been very honest, which is very important uh, in terms of having a broad and open discussion. And I think that's really uh, how we can move forward by having an honest discussion and being able to respect differences, but being honest about what you think. So thank you very much once again for coming along and uh, providing us with your, thank you.
Good morning here in Davos, Switzerland, and around the world. My name is Eric Schatzker. I'm an anchor and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Television. Welcome to an insight, an idea, with Marissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo. Marissa, good morning to you. Good morning. If I'm not mistaken, this is the first such conversation you've had since becoming CEO in July. Is that right? That's right. Well, I must thank you. It's an honor, uh, both for me and for the World Economic Forum. We're here to talk about the future of technology. So let's begin with the one nut that nobody seems to have been able to crack, the platform shift from desktop to mobile. How do you crack that nut? Well, I think that, one, is it's really important. If you look at what's happening in terms of the shift to mobile, the number of mobile phones and smartphones in the world has tripled in five years. Tablet sales will outsell laptops this coming year um, if predictions hold true. So it's really incredibly important, and there's a lot of consumers overall making this shift. So one is understanding how these devices work, what they really provide for, and how we can best meet users' expectations. And the, of course, the other piece is monetization. And that's the nut. That, uh, there's all kinds of really interesting applications that are, exist on the phone. The real question is making money from it. And I have a lot of faith and confidence that whenever you see a consumer shift of this type, that there will be a very interesting value-added way for, for, for to, to create a monetization around it. Where but, does that confidence come from? Um, well, it was sort of the, the bane of my existence from about 1999 to 2004 <laughs> um, was that the, at the time I was at Google, and for about five years, every time I interacted with anyone externally, uh, the, the one question they would ask me is, you know, search is wonderful, it's so great to be able to find everything that we can find, it's just wonderfully academic, how is anyone ever going to make any money from it? And now that seems almost absurd because search is one of the giant money makers, it's not the giant money maker online. Um, but that said, whenever you see consumers adopting a technology, a platform, you know, a particular application like search, this, with this much volume, you know that advertisers will want to participate in that. And there's usually a way where you can introduce advertising such that it's not intrusive, that it actually adds value to the end user, and that it actually enhances the experience, and that's what we, uh, that's what we need to work on. Well, we can look backward now and see how that was done with search. Everybody gets to play Monday morning quarterback and sure. feel smart about it. Can you tell yet what some of the shifts will be in mobile that will allow mobile to duplicate the success of search as a money maker, because it has to make money or else at some point innovation will grind to a halt. Well, and I think people already are. There, you know, for example, the application store, there's a lot of people who sell applications. Uh, so there's, you know, there's some monetization there. Uh, I think the big thing is search is a daily habit. And what people do on their phones often become daily habits. Uh, it was interesting for me when I thought about the strategy for Yahoo, uh, I pulled the list of what people do on their phones in rank order frequency. And if you ignore a few exceptions, the things that are going to be done by the carriers, like voice and text and maps, because I know from my former life that it was really, uh, it's really expensive and hard to do right, the list looks like email, check the weather, check news, get financial quotes, check sports scores, play games, share photos, you get the idea, and it was funny because I would go and I would recite that list in the context of being you know, the new CEO at Yahoo, and I would say, what am I doing? And my friends and family would say, well, you're describing Yahoo's business. I said, no, actually what I'm doing is I'm listing in frequency order what people do on their phones. So the nice thing at Yahoo is we have all of the content that people want on their phones. We have these daily habits. And I think whenever you're dealing with a daily habit, uh, and really providing a lot of value around it, there's an opportunity not only to provide that value to the end user, but also to create a great business. To your point, search remains one of the defining experiences for most internet users. Whether we call it search, whether we call it content discovery, it seems to me that it will remain, uh, the way you described it, fundamental to what we do. How do you see it evolving? Well, I think that all of the innovations that you'll see in search will be in the user interface layer. So, you know, if you look at the past few years, there's been universal search, the, the notion that search won't always be text-based. You can get videos and images, instant search. So when you're typing, the fact that it's very speedy and responsive, 
voice search, the fact that now you know, something like a quarter to a third of, of searches are done by voice uh, on the phone. So all of those types of, of things are what we're going to see evolve in the future. And I also think that there is a huge opportunity in search around personalization. Understanding what do I know already, what are my preferences, and how to present the information. And I think that that extends beyond just search, but broadly to discovery. If we can think about how do we take the internet and order it for you, there's all these news feeds all over, all over the web that you know, people will check, Twitter, Facebook. And you know, the question is, really, what order should people read things in the morning? What should they look at? How should they do that? And to really do a great job in that kind of discovery mode, in addition to search, you need a terrific sense of personalization. Will personalization then, in some respects, replace search? That once the computer, so to speak, figures out what it is we like to look for, It'll just look for it on our behalf, and we won't have to go and do it any longer. I think the right way to think of it is it's not that it replaces search, but it becomes a critical part of search. You know, I think one provocative way of thinking about it is in term, terms of a lot of people will say, well, when you type into the search box, that's your query. In the future, you become the query. It's what you typed. It's your background. It's where you are. It's your preferences. It's what you looked at yesterday. And the search box can take all of that as the input and come up with a set of res results that are customized for you. And the nice thing is if you're the query, one, you could actually explicitly type in search terms, or you could just be the query passively. Uh, you know, this is the notion that if we can pick up on your context, who you're talking to, where you are, can we actually provide useful information or a series of links, pictures, videos that are actually more useful in your current context because of that context. That sounds exciting, but right now the web for most of us is still a very managed, curated experience. How long does it take before we get there and what are the key enabling technologies going to be? Sure. Um, I think it's probably going to happen in the next three to five years. I think that a lot of what we've seen happen, image recognition, voice recognition, translation, these were all backbone technologies to really being able to understand context now it's a matter of being able to take the personalized notions that people have already been expressing online. Things like likes on Facebook. What do you tweet? What do you pin on Pinterest? Right? What articles do you click on? Taking all of those little signals and mapping those to understand that when, for example, I like clean energy on Facebook and I tweet out something about green energy, that that's in fact the same interest of mine. Are different companies going to do it differently or is this the kind of thing that everybody's going to have to move in the same direction on? Uh, I think that, uh, that different companies will do it, do it differently. I think that one of the key pieces here is you have to understand and decide what the ontology of entities is. Explain that. Um, meaning, you know, how are things named? How are they organized into hierarchies? Um, so, for example, you need to know that Wisconsin is a state and that there are cities inside of it. I'm from it. So if I say that I like Wisconsin, that there's a whole bunch of interests that cascade off of that. And so you need to understand that hierarchy of, of, of objects, but you also need to be able to understand how they relate to each other and synonyms, deduplication, things like that. Does this personalization then become uh, you know, the way that you described it is somehow complementary to search. Does that create a new paradigm? You know, we talk, or, or at least, you know, the most recent thing that any of the large uh, internet companies has come out with is this social search that Facebook has introduced. Is that a stepping stone along the way to what you see? I think so. I mean, I'm, there's, there's the social graph, which is, you know, really important and very fundamental. But it, I think what I'm talking about in terms of personalization, it will give, it will give way to the interest graph. What is that? The interest graph is the set of things that I'm interested in. And if you know the set of things that I'm interested in, you know the set of things other people are interested in, you can, do, you can create connections between people that aren't just based on whether or not they went to the same school or worked in the same place, but are actually based on are they interested in the same things. So for one, we can meet, create very powerful personalization technologies because we can see what other people who like the same things or are interested in the same things that you are are doing and provide you the same information through things like collaborative filtering. But there's also a very powerful social component there because we can show you interests you may have in common with people you didn't realize. 
Um, you know, for example, I recently found out that Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, and I both had the same uh, major at Stanford, symbolic systems. So, you know, you can see these kinds of things in the interest graph. Uh, but you can also find people who you maybe have never met but really should know because you have so much in common with them. It would seem to me that it's a pretty high bar, or at least uh, the barrier to entry to the interest graph is pretty high. You've got to have, as a company, as a platform, a fairly broad and deep level of user engagement, don't you? That's right. Uh, and we're, I mean, we're really very lucky at Yahoo because we have the homepage. We also have finance and sports and games and news and you know, things like OMG, you know, which is celebrity, celebrity news. And so there's a lot of different verticals that we, that we, we play in, and then also very broad uh, applications like search and mail. Does the interest graph have the potential to disrupt sort of the paradigm for tech power that was in some respect, if not set, coined by your old boss, Eric Schmidt, the four horsemen, Google, of course, Apple, Facebook, and Amazon? Could the, could the interest graph, or perhaps even something else, mm -hmm change that order of the universe? Well, I mean, I think all four of those players do a really terrific job providing a lot of great experiences for end users. And so, I mean, I think that all four of those will, those people will become major players in the future. I think that the, the piece that the four horsemen uh, analogy misses is that there are other players in the space. I think, for example, Twitter is very, it was very exciting and very interesting. And I do think that technology isn't stagnant. It's you know, amazing to think about the different waves of the internet and technology, right? You know, the first wave really was Yahoo itself, the directory. There's these pages out there. How do you organize them? And then the web got so large that the directory model broke down and gave way to search. And then, you know, then the next wave came with social. And now I really think we're on the mobile wave. And so, you know, and you think about that, that's all happened in about, you know, 15 years. Right? We've gone through four major uh, technology shifts in terms of who the main players really are. And so I think that there's always opportunity for new disruption. And I think that a lot of this will be around interests, but that's just my prediction. So we shouldn't, as consumers or in any other role that we may occupy, worry about the control that certain companies may exercise over the Internet itself and the information that it contains? Well, I mean, I think that privacy will always be something that users should consider. But I also think that privacy is always a trade-off. Because when you give up some of your personal information, you get some functionality in return. And so it's really about making those trade-offs in a very informed way, which really comes around, you know, for me, the core principles of privacy online are transparency, choice, and control. Tell the users what information you have and how you use it. Allow them to control what information you have. And choice, do they want to use the service in a personalized way that involves that information or not? And so I think those are really the big three components of privacy online. And I also fundamentally believe that user data belongs to the end user. You do? Yes. Because mm -hmm. clearly, you know, the question of control is the one that gets people most exercised. How do you ensure, or how does, how does any company that participates in this space, this industry, whatever you want to call it, um, a, guarantee that that remains the case, and provide users with enough confidence that the information that they share isn't being abused. Well, the, the second part is all about transparency. You know, what do you do? You what, have to you know, how do you, that how, you know, what searches do you have and exactly how are they being used? And so, and I do think that that's something that is really important. I think that there will be industry standards that arise in terms of really providing users almost an account statement. Uh, you know, if you look at the, some of the various dashboards around data that exist on some of these, these primary platforms, they really, what they really show you is what data do you have stored there and how is it used. Um, and I really think that one of the key, key pieces here that also provides for a lot of user choice is making sure that the data is portable, that there are standardized formats which really allow your barrier to switching providers or switching carriers to be lower. So, you know, one of my, you know, one of the analogies I'll use is, you know, papers you wrote in college, are they yours? Absolutely. I feel like they are. What, what if, you know, so now <laughs> think about. nobody else is interested. So now think about the, the searches that you've done over the past 10 years. Not nearly as coherent, not nearly structured, you know, in, in, in uh, eloquent prose, but just as insightful in terms of they were your thoughts, your words expressed your way. 
and they tell a lot about what you know, what you've learned. And I do f believe that fundamentally they're yours. And if you can take that history, pick it up and move to a different search provider, or take that as an interest graph in and of itself, and, and apply it and use it in a different application, that's something that should fundamentally belong to you. You're allowing the service to access it in order to get better information and better results, and they need to deliver on that promise, or else you'll take your data and go elsewhere. Well, that's, that, that raises an interesting question. Should you be able to take all of that data, and it sounds to me like, depending on how deep your level of engagement, it could be a great deal, and move it from one platform to another? Is that possible? Um, it's generally... I can see, I can see you know, <laughs> one platform being resistant to the idea of my taking all of what I've got and moving it to somebody else. It's certainly technologically possible, and a lot of the players are providing for things like that. It's not something that's generally you know, something that people think about doing every day, but it is an option, and I think that it's an important one. Uh, it can give users a lot of, of, of confidence in terms of how things are handled. You described a couple of months ago how one of your employees asked how Yahoo's going to compete if it doesn't have one of these four key distribution technologies. There's the mobile operating system, mobile hardware, the browser, and social. I don't know that we got an answer. Yeah, well, so it was funny because one of our employees at one of the company meetings asked that, and they said, you know, given that we don't have mobile hardware, a mobile OS, a browser, or a social network, how are we going to compete? And um, it's not just a question for Yahoo. <laughs> Clearly, it's a question for every company that seeks to compete with those others that have those key enabling technologies. Sure, and you know, the, of the four horsemen of the internet, to adopt that analogy, almost all of them are playing in one, if not several, of those, of those medium. But I think that the, the big piece here is that it really allows us to partner. Yahoo's always been a very friendly company, has always been, because of our focus also, not in, in addition to technology, but also on media, it ultimately means that there's really an opportunity for strong partnerships, and that's what we'll be focused on. So we work with, for example, Apple and Google mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the operating system. In terms of the social network, we have a strong uh, partnership with Facebook. And so we're able to work with some of these players that have a lot of strength. Uh, in order to really bolster our user experiences that we offer on the Yahoo site. Is that die cast? You talked about uh, you know, this new graph, the interest graph. Is that the kind of technology uh, that will become key to distribution? Uh, well, I definitely think with the web becoming so vast, there's so much content and there's so much social context. And now with mobile, there's so much location context and activity context. How do you pull all of that together? And, when you, and the interesting way to take it is to say, okay, we're gonna use some of that information, your personalization, your context, what you've done, all that, to actually make sense of the content. It's really the internet ordered for you. Which is interesting because it actually brings Yahoo back to its roots. It used to be that that's what Yahoo was. It took the internet and ordered it up. Now it's so vast that you can't just categorize it anymore, but could we provide a list of information, a feed, if you will, of information that is ordered, is the, is the web ordered for you, and is also available on your mobile phone? Some of those technologies remain tremendously competitive. There's competition in the browser world, there's certainly incredible competition in the mobile hardware world, and in the operating system world. What about social? Is the war for social over? Um, I think that you know, Facebook provides an amazing platform. And so I think that it will be one of the predominant platforms, if not the pr predominant pl platform. But now what happens with social is what you do with it. It's not just about writing down who your friends are. It's actually about taking that and finding useful content and, and telling me, hey, you know, you're in Davos right now. Do you know who else is? Right? And, and being able to offer me the opportunity to opportunistically meet up with someone who I didn't know would be here. There's a natural conflict, isn't there, in the world of technology between innovation and execution. We see many companies struggling with it. Can both be done well at the same time? It's funny because it was pointed out to me a few years ago that you know, one, one hypothesis is that innovation, if you think about what's the opposite of innovation, a lot of people will say, well, it's the status quo. It's stagnancy. And you know, there's another school of thought which says that the opposite of innovation is execution that if you have to be in heads down execution mode, it's very hard to find the space to innovate, to have those new ideas and to pull things in. And I know that you know, for us at Yahoo right now, there is, this is gonna be a great period of execution. 
can we take these products that we have and revitalize them for the web and also make the transition to mobile. And while we're doing that execution, will there be room to innovate to say, hey, this is how Yahoo Groups worked on the web, but now there's all these new opportunities in terms of how group communication should work on the phone. You know, can we actually spot some of those innovative ideas? And I think there is, but it's hard, because I do think that they are natural opposites. Is size a barrier to innovation? Um, I don't think so, because I think that it, what it has to, if you, you can innovate at scale and with large size, but you have to be very principled about it. You know, if you have, say, 10 engineers and you're going to grow that to be 20 or 30, do you want to be doing the same set of things two or three times better, or do you want to be doing two or three times more things? And in terms of really, you know, interestingly, in terms of execution, this is a great example of why they're such, so opposite, so much opposites, that if you really wanted to execute perfectly, get the design exactly right, really work through all the details, you'd invest two to three times as many people per project. If you want to find those new ideas, those far-flung ideas, those things you might not otherwise find, you want to take those same people and put them on something that's far-flung that you've never thought about. And so, you know, it really is that there, that, that there is this tension. So I think that you can innovate at scale, but you need to save room to have small teams working on those far-flung ideas. So share with us a little of your experience over the past few months. You arrived to an innovative company, but perhaps there was too much going on, wasn't disciplined enough to the points that you were just making. What have you focused on? What are you most excited about when it comes to innovative technologies, particularly the ones that you have some control over? Um, well, I was really very overall just genuinely pleased and surprised. I knew that there had to be great people at Yahoo. The same way that when you sometimes look at art, you can tell if it was created by a nice person or not, or a depressed person or not. Like when you feel Yahoo's products, you can tell that there's really nice, very smart, competent people there that have a great time. And, you know, and it's true, that it's, it's a great company overall that has a very fun culture. And you know, for my first few months, my focus really was on people. Because I believe fundamentally that technology companies live and die by talent. And you know, that's why when you know, people talk about the talent wars, it's not really that some of the companies that are in the talent wars are that competitive with each other. It's just that when you start to see the best people migrating from one company to the next, it means that the next wave is starting. And so I got very focused on people, building the right team, particularly the executive layer, but all through the business, and also the overall environment. And part of that was because I wanted to make sure that Yahoo is absolutely the best place to work and the people really want to come and work there because that will help with the talent piece. But also because I believe that really strong companies all have very strong cultures. And Yahoo's no exception. It's been a very strong company for a very long time. It's got a strong culture. It's different from every other, other, every other corporate culture. Each has their own unique and individual flavor. And I really wanted to find a way to amplify it. Because in amplifying it, that's how you find the energy. And the energy is what you can harness into that innovation and say, OK, if we have people and they are really excited about what they're working on every day and they realize that you know, the next big hurdle is mobile, you can take that energy around the culture and find fun ways to apply it that can be really impactful for end users. What are some of the things that you found that we're going to see over the next few months? Uh, well, I don't like to talk about things before we do them. Um, but I do think that you know, a lot of the keys are what I've already talked about. I think that there is a real opportunity to help guide people's daily habits in terms of what content they read. And that's something that's, that, that's something that we're really working on. I think that all of these daily habits, news, sports, games, finance, search, mail, answers, groups, these are the flicker. These are the types of things where you know, they've, we've really been underinvested in them. And a little love will go a long way. Uh, it turns out I learned the other day that Yahoo Groups, uh, which I remember using you know, really pervasively back in 2001 because I was friends with the founders, um, it hasn't been refreshed in like 11 years. So it will go a long way if we actually <laughs> start to, to modernize some of these products. So, so basically identifying what are some of these key technologies. And I do think that the user-generated content component is something that Yahoo very much pioneered. 
with things like Yahoo Answers and Yahoo Groups. And Flickr, for example, was one of the first social photo services. Now a lot of people think a lot more about user-generated content and video, which is also really important. But going back to some of those roots of saying, okay, now that social really allows everyone to be a publisher, and for you to find interesting questions to answer, find topics where you're a domain expert and write about them, and for your friends and others who know that you're an expert in that field or know you to come and find your answer, I really do think that there's something very powerful that we can unleash there in terms of the content that we can surface for end users and its utility. How about elsewhere in the world of technology, whether it's at big companies or little mm -hmm. startups, what other innovations excite you? Oh. Um, I don't know, I think that there's so, many, there's so many things. This is a question I like to ask people. And the one question you never want, as the, number, the one answer you never want to give is, you know, oh, I'm very discerning, there's nothing that good out there. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, a kid, I think there's like amazing things that you get to see uh, all the time. Um, you know, there's, you know, all kinds of amazing technologies on mobile. When you think about, for example, just what it means to be location sensitive. Location is something I've spent a fair amount of time in the past few years thinking about. There's all kinds of really terrific technologies there. Some of these are you know, very basic in terms of things like being able to check in. So there's Foursquare, but if you actually know where people are and where they check in, there's all kinds of interesting and sophisticated things you can go on to do. Uh, so I think that there's amazing technologies like that. But even branching out from, say, you know, the mobile technologies and desktop technologies, there's just terrific things happening overall, like the world of biotech, in terms of being able to do DNA analysis, analyze, you know, and help, you know, infertile couples actually do a better job selecting children and, and embryos to implant because you know whether or not they have problematic mutations. There's a great company I know of there called Natera. Um, there's an amazing company that's working on wireless power. You know, this is the thing of like Atlas Shrugged. Can you have you know, an, an, you know, an, an automated uh, energy machine? But it actually can happen. They actually think that you can send energy using waves. You have to be pretty close. But just think about what that might mean, you know, in terms of all of us running around and plugging things in. You might just need to get close enough to the router that you can pick up on the power. And what that could do for the world of advertising, if you know, for example, the sign at the bus stop that's you know, lit up from behind, actually had you know, wireless power behind it. You could sit there at the bus stop and charge while you're using your device. It would be pretty amazing. So there's all kinds of, of really exciting new things that people work on every day. When people get excited about technology, they often forget about the role of design. Apple taught us. Apple changed mm -hmm. the way that many of us interact with technology, interact with uh, the internet itself, uh, and that maybe form can be as important or perhaps more so than function. How much do you think about that? How important is it to what you're doing? Well, I think about design a lot. I think that you know, Apple is obviously the gold standard. But I think that in that, you know, Apple's philosophy really is that the design and the technology itself should fall away. And I think that's really true, that a lot of these interaction technologies become really powerful when they do just fall away. I think the amazing thing about tablets, you know, the fact that you can just you know, flick and get rid of things and switch from page to page, you know, the pinch, the zoom, these are things that are so intuitive that you actually can see small children you know, begin to use a tablet. You know, there's terrific you know, videos that, that parents, proud parents will upload showing children that before they can even learn to talk, they know how to turn the page and flick things on iPads. And, you know, and they can navigate within videos to their favorite part. They can't even express why they like that part, but they know how to get there using the gestures on the tablet. So, you know, that, but what's really powerful about that is, is, is it uses the natural paradigms that people already have embedded in their minds that are, that are somewhat innate to us, and they allow it to be the way that we use this technology. And I think that that's incredibly powerful. And so that's overall what, what you really want to have happen, is being able to whittle away the technology such that all of the complication lies underneath, right? It's like an iceberg. You know, there's just that, that thin little layer that you interact with. I think that's one of the reasons, for example, why voice recognition is so so it has taken off to the, way, to the degree that it has, and why Siri is something that is so um, interesting for people is because this notion that you could just talk, right? You could just say what you're thinking and transcribe an email or transcribe a text or transcribe a search. That is just the way that you navigate and have every day of your life, and now there's this whole set of technology and supercomputers that just with your voice, you can actually have do what you want them to do.
Is that to say that a level of curation that something akin to a walled garden isn't such a bad idea may actually be necessary? Well, I think that there is a clear tension there of you know open systems versus closed. I do think that the you know the application system uh, that exists in iOS and in Apple is you know very curated and but absolutely beautiful, and you can tell that. The, the, the reason I don't think that that's such a bad thing is because it's really raised users' expectations of design. Where people didn't, I think, used to think about design or appreciate it that much. The fact that when you see something that's really beautiful, it does create a lot of respect for it. And I think that one of the reasons why you know, Apple has, has got, garnered so much praise for its design is that it's made sure that, for example, the entire ecosystem of applications on that platform work and perform just beautifully and that and when you notice that you start to realize the role the design really plays in your everyday life. Marissa, I want to thank you on behalf of the World Economic Forum for this opportunity and insight and idea with Marissa Meyer, the future of technology. Thank you. Thank you.
And we are here with the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Prime Minister Naguib bin Tok Abdul Razak. Um, it is a great honor and a great pleasure to have you, Prime Minister. Thank you. I want to start with something you wrote. You wrote an article for the New York Times in which you said the central challenge, or one of the central challenges facing the Islamic world is the problem of Muslim youth. Explain what you meant. What is that challenge? It is evident that the, um, the pressure for change came about from the youth. In the Arab Spring. In the Arab Spring. And if in, in any country for that matter, not only a Muslim country, if unemployment among the youth runs at 25% or even more, and coupled with a rather um, autocratic system, which is not responsive to the needs of the people, then you have a very lethal combination, which eventually resulted in, in a massive a demand for change, even a violent demand for change. And that's exactly the challenge, I think, facing most countries, particularly the Muslim world, that we have to take care of the young people. We have to give them jobs. We, most importantly, we have to give them hope for the future. Is that about education? Is it mostly about jobs? It is, I think, the whole raft of things that you have to do. Basically, you start with education. But beyond that, you have to have a, a system that will actually deliver. You've got to deliver them jobs. You have to give, deliver them a promise of a better future. And if these people are marginalized for whatever reason, uh, then uh, you, know, you get situations in which uh, they will be very restless. You, you talk about, you know, in a sense, kind of getting the society moving, getting the dynamics so that you have these jobs and opportunities. What about the, the point that other people make? That, no, 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 you need to reform it within Islam, that you need to uh, de-radicalize elements of, of, of Islam. What do you say to them? I think, I think uh, in, in a sense, uh, you know, we, we in Malaysia, if I can use Malaysia as an example, we would take the initiative for change because I'm a great advocate of a planned change, systematic plan transformation, because that will give you the outcome that is more desirable than a violent change. And until today, those countries embroiled in the Arab Spring have not really fully recovered. They've not got the dividends of that. And it will be some time before they can really, you know, kind of stabilize the situation. Maybe it's stabilized today, but in terms of, you know, getting the kind of growth, getting more jobs, getting a better future, I think there's quite some way uh, before that will, will happen. And with respect to Islam itself, I think the, the whole interpretation of Islam you know, has to be predicated on the fact that Islam is fundamentally a moderate and progressive religion. And that's exactly how you know, we've tried to do it in Malaysia. But you have had critics. You have had um, fundamentalists in Malaysia who wanted much more you know, extreme, puritanical, call it what you will, version of Islam. Do, do, how, do you, how do you diffuse that kind of criticism? Uh, you know, by engaging them, uh, you know, by, by uh, communicating to the people uh, that, uh, you know, Islam is essentially a moderate and progressive religion. Uh, the fact that we don't have, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the hudud laws in Malaysia, uh, you know, you know doesn't, doesn't mean that you're not an Islamic country. I mean, uh, Egypt doesn't have uh, uh, hudud laws. I explain what those are. Those are, those are the full Sharia uh, laws, you know, you know amputation for, um, for, for stealing, for example, and stoning for adultery, things like that. Uh, because the, the fundamental objective for Sharia law is actually to achieve justice. Uh, and that's that important, not to lose sight of the fact that that is fundamental to the objective of Sharia, is to achieve justice. And that Islam is essentially about advice. It's not about punishment. It's about prevention. It's about advice. It's about educating people. The tarbiyah, as they say in Arabic, it is educating people. Where do, how do you rate the dangers of 
uh, Islamic radicalism, jihadi groups, militant Islam, terrorism, you know, that whole spectrum uh, in Southeast Asia today. After 9-11, as you remember, there were many fears, uh, and there was the Bali bombing right after. It was the first major terrorist attack after. And so people thought, well, maybe Southeast Asia is going to be the, new, the next place where all this bubbles up. Where do we stand in 2013? I think, I think most of it is behind us, actually. I think we've dealt with the radical Islam, the extreme version of Islam, uh, in a positive way. Of course, um, you know, uh, some form of uh, you know, military-type actions were unavoidable. Uh, but, you know, by, by, by um, communicating what Islam is all about, and also, you, you, you must have read that we were involved in solving the southern Philippines, Bangsamoro thing problem that went on for 40 years and, and cost the lives of 120,000 people, that meant, uh, you know, the whole potential of that area being radicalized, being linked up with uh, 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 Al-Qaeda directly or through the various groups, and that has been eliminated. So that's a huge contribution to, towards, uh, you know, peace. And, and, and a more uh, a moderate form of Islam in, in Southeast Asia. So your intelligence services uh, sense that the kind of things that they worried about in 2002, 2003, it's, it's, it's waned, it has declined. It has receded uh, quite substantially. But the threat really more you know, comes from, from Indonesia, uh, you know, because uh, you know, some of the madrasas uh, that they have there uh, has been a source of some of the radical preachings of Islam. And from Indonesia, they went to Malaysia. Uh, Abu Bakr Bashir, for example, uh, preached in Malaysia, and he radicalized a few Malaysians. But uh, Indonesians have been more effective now dealing with it. So I think the whole threat of militant Islam, I think it has receded quite substantially in Southeast Asia. You have set yourself a goal a somewhat ambitious goal of uh, getting Malaysia out of the middle income trap. Uh, this is a range of per capita GDP, uh, you know, somewhere between six, six and twelve thousand, thirteen thousand dollars, where countries do get stuck. There are very few that have made the transition out of it. Uh, if you look back over the last twenty or thirty years, you see Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, but that's sort of it. Um, what are you going to do? What, what is the, is there a, a silver bullet that gets you, gets you out of the trap? It's exactly what, you know, we realized when I came to office uh, 2009, I realized that we have recovered. Once we recovered from the Asian financial crisis of 1997, but growth was slowing down. It was not at the breakneck speed, 8, 9% we used to have. It was slowing down in region of 3 to 4%. And then it was then that we realized that we were in a so-called middle-income trap. So we needed a breakout strategy. And the breakout strategy was the new economic model. The new economic model was predicated on two important uh, programs. One is the economic transformation program. The other one is the strategic reform initiative, SRIs. So if I can use an analogy, the... Uh, ETP uh, would be akin to a vehicle, a car, that's traveling fast. But the, the, the SRI, the reform initiatives, would be like the highway. You do need a quality highway in order for you to drive quite fast and get there safely. So with the combination of both, we have managed to turn the situation around. Uh, you know, we have achieved 5% growth rate. Five, uh, last third quarter last year was 5.2 percent. Since, uh, um, since 2009 when I came in, the income per head uh, GDP was 6,700 US dollars. Uh, last year it was 9,750. That's a 45 percent jump in income per capita within four years. So. Um, the results speak for themselves. Real change and real progress is taking place in Malaysia. Now, you have one big advantage that a lot of mid middle-income countries don't, which is you have oil and natural gas, and oil prices are 
a high um, in historical terms. Uh, does that has that been a cushion that has allowed you to to get through this? Yes, but you have to use uh, your oil wealth in in a very prudent way, because there's there's of course the the oil trap as well as you know. Uh, I think basically we've done quite well with oil resources, uh, but we should not uh, use too much of that uh, for subsidy, for example, because that's uh, short-term consumption. You need to use the oil wealth to increase your productive capacity, your productive to invest in productive investment that will generate uh, higher incomes in the future. Is the is the sh should you go even further? and adopt the model that a country like Norway does, which is that all the oil revenue goes into a trust and is not used for current governmental expenditures? A small portion of that has gone into that trust. I think we can do a lot, a lot more. may not be quite like uh, the Norwegian model, uh, but as for as long as that kind of income is used in terms of productive investment, even short-term productive investment, which will yield dividends of a longer period. You have had um, relations with Singapore, I mean Malaysia, that have been uh, sometimes uh, cordial and sometimes not so cordial. Uh, where would you say things stand now? Uh, I think there's, there's, there's um, a realization, I think, between Sian Log and myself uh, that we should put the past behind us, that our future of Malaysia and, and Singapore are inextricably linked. And if we can work together in a more cooperative way, then both Malaysia and Singapore would benefit. Certainly Iskandar, for example, you talk about Iskandar, the development uh, opposite Singapore, is hugely dependent on, on, on Singapore. On but, uh, and Singapore is also dependent on, on Malaysia because uh, they need the space. Uh, and because uh, the cost is going up in Singapore. So, so I told Sian Lung recently that, I don't mind, you can be the Manhattan, or we'll be New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> um, Prime Minister, you lost uh, the two-third majority you had in, in, in Parliament. Um, UMNO has been a dominant party. Uh, why did you lose, and what does it tell you about what are inevitably going to be the upcoming elections in Malaysia? We're dealing with uh, a, a more, you know, difficult uh, uh, voters today. I think uh, a few things have happened. Uh, it's structural in nature. It is not cyclical as such. Um, you know, I see the advent of uh, ICT, social media, uh, as both uh, something good, but also our being could be our Achilles heel as well. Uh, and I'll see the, you know, the level of expectation uh, increasing and people are much more educated and therefore more critical. Uh, having realized that, uh, therefore, uh, as the government, uh, we need to do things differently. Uh, we need to realize that you know, people are not going to give their vote to you based on how much you've done in the past. I mean, nobody can deny the fact that you know, I'm no and Barisa National, we are, we are the people who fought for independence. We are the people who developed the country. But, you know, the people today are saying, okay, that's in the past. Uh, what we want to know, what can you do for us now and in the future? And that's important for us to realize that, uh, you know, the levels of, of uh, expectations have increased by leaps and bounds. So therefore, you know, the kind of performance that we have to deliver as, as the government has indeed, uh, you know, as the bar has been raised very considerably. Uh, but we are, you know, we are committed, we're working as hard as possible. And I think uh, I'm encouraged by the support that we have received by the people. And hopefully we'll get a good uh, mandate this time around. Do you think Anwar Ibrahim is your most uh, formidable foe? Well, certainly he's head of the opposition. Uh, and, uh, We'd like to, uh, you know, to uh, present our agenda to the people, and I believe that the people will see that our agenda for the country is more credible. 
What about the preferences that are given in Malaysia for the Malays, uh, policy that is controversial, particularly with the Chinese uh, business community, mm. which feels that it, uh, it is, it is uh, not moving in the direction a modern country should, mm, mm, which is mm, meritocratic mm, uh, mm. and based on achievement and reward. Mm, mm. Uh, you still have many, many preferences. Yeah. Mm. Is there, a, um, will you rethink that mm. and will you implement a rethink, a, a, a change? In fact, a process has started. For example, uh, entry to university now is based on, on merit. Uh, and and, and uh, that setting has increased a percentage of uh, Chinese Malaysians into university. But uh, uh, interestingly, the Malaysian Indians have fared badly. So they won a quota system. Because the previous system, you know, they got about 7%. But now it's down to about 3%. But that goes to show that it is based on merit. And uh, helping people who deserve to be helped, for example, those uh, with whose income level is, you know, 3,000 ringgit or $1,000 per month. And that's across the board, irrespective of ethnic background. So everybody gets it. So we are moving towards a policy on the basis of needs as opposed to the basis of race. But there still is a feeling there's some, there's some. that with government yeah, contracts, yeah. with all those things, there's still but a lot. But even government contract, I think quite, quite a bit of it is based on open bidding. Uh, some of it, of course, uh, uh, there's some preference for Bumi Putra. But the, by and large, the uh, non-Malays in Malaysia, non-Bumi Putra in Malaysia, don't actually oppose affirmative action. But what they want is to be seen, the way you implement that policy, should be done in a more transparent and fairer way. And what, what they deserve as Malaysians, the non Muslims, then they should also get what they deserve. As you look at uh, East Asia, um, do, you, do you worry about the rise of China? Many East Asian countries over the last two years, Philippines, Vietnam, certainly Japan, of course, uh, have been quite worried about what they see as um, Chinese moves, uh, territorial, uh, otherwise, that are something of a departure and suggest a new assertive China. I think the rise of China is uh, inevitable. I think we have to come to terms with that. Uh, and if you accept the fact that you know, China will be the economic power and the size of the economy not per capita, but certainly the size economy, will exceed that of the United States by maybe 2030 or even sooner, then you realize that there are opportunities that you can leverage on, on, on the size of that economy. And that's taking a very positive attitude towards China. And uh, China has become our number one trading partner. Total trade between Malaysia and China, taking into account trade from third countries it's approaching $100 billion a year, and that's huge. So China is a big market for us. Uh, you know, China is also becoming a bigger investor to Malaysia. You know, the first, interestingly, the first um, Chinese university that has been allowed by the government to have a foreign branch campus is Malaysia. Uh, and and that, that university will will be a reality in a couple of years' time. So we have this very, very positive and mutually beneficial relationship with China. But a, a, a China that's big is also a China that's going to be more assertive. It goes with it. And, and therefore, we, we need to manage that. And, and I believe that uh, uh, you know, we can negotiate, we can enter into uh, dialogue with China and uh, trying to find uh, peaceful, amicable uh, solutions, particularly to the South China Sea issue. You had a diplomatic foray recently. You, t you went to Gaza and you visited the leadership of Hamas. Is it not fair to say that Hamas remains a principal uh, stumbling block on the road to peace? Because in order to have a two-state solution, the Israelis would argue, you need the Palestinians to accept the right of Israel to exist, and Hamas mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. not accept mm -hmm. the right of Israel to mm -hmm. exist. I think we should go step by step. 
I think one, the first thing is to have unity government uh, in, in, in representing the entire Palestinian people. Without a unity government, uh, I don't think uh, any kind of a peaceful solution would be possible. Did you tell that to Hamas? I did, in no uncertain terms. Uh, privately as well as my speeches. First of all, I said I came here for humanitarian reasons. I did not come here to side with Hamas. I did not come here to interfere with the internal politics. 